I worked for HP for almost 25 years. Uh, if you count the vacation time I had left, okay, maybe 25 years. And uh, I started at HP when I ran out of money at Stanford, and I got hired as a summer help, and I arranged my classes at Stanford so I could uh, work uh, uh, at least half a day for the rest of my time at Stanford and then joined the company full time when I graduated. Now, HP, uh, a lot of the, I worked in, in the HP labs and uh, a lot of the designs that we did at HP uh, it didn't come from within. And uh, there were a couple of guys, a couple of different companies uh, came to HP and one group saw Bill Hewlett, who was the, the vice president at the time, and the other group saw Barney Oliver. So some uh, aerospace engineers had formed, a, were trying to put together a calculator company and uh, they uh, were using some ideas that they got from a B-58 Hustler auto navigation program. And, uh, and they, but their machine, it was a, a desktop calculator, but uh, an HP wasn't interested particularly in a desktop calculator, never thought of it. And, uh, but it was a fixed point machine. And that was fine for auto navigation because it didn't, it knew the number of digits it needed and so on. And, uh, and they, they actually showed it to Barney Oliver. And then uh, another fellow, Tom Osborne, brought in a floating point uh, four function machine that, uh, and they, these guys showed it to Bill Hewlett. And the question was, uh, yeah, you Talk louder, please. Talk louder. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Was that a yes? <laughs> well, okay. The, the question is, could these concepts be merged? And uh, so uh, a bunch of us from HP Labs uh, were called together, about 20 of us, I guess, and they started handing out assignments of who was going to look at, at this item in the hardware and this item and so on. And then the question came up that Barney Oliver asked, well, who's going to handle the algorithms? Now, I had been in the service, and I knew not to ever ask a question. However, I said, what's an algorithm? <laughs> <laughs> and, and Barney Oliver, the vice president of R&D, he said, Dave, you're going to find out. Okay, let's see. Oops, wrong way. Well, one of the first things I found out was the origin of the word algorithm. And it's a step-by-step -step process to solve a problem. And it's a Origin is a 9th century uh, Arab or Persian mathematician. It's not his name. His name is Muhammad. It's a village he's from. al Khurizmi. Now, A-L means of the, and that's the same in Spanish and so on. And uh, the Khurizmi comes out to be algorithm or algorithm. <laughs> and then, uh, in the HP library, uh, one of the librarians there really helped me a lot. And uh, she found this logarithmic calculations by Henry Briggs, and it's in Latin, and it's Henricus Briggs. But it was written in 1624. Now, when, when HP did the desktop calculator, uh, we manufactured for a while, and one of the uh, uh, Boston companies, the Wang Labs, 
who had developed a loci tube and did uh, logarithms on a calculator. And so they sent us uh, HP a, a letter saying that we were infringing on her patent. I sent a copy of this paper written in 1624 as prior art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think all you recognize, all you need is a year prior. This was several hundred years. Now, a couple of other documentation that, that helped uh, along the way for uh, defining the algorithms. Cortic computing technique. Uh, Cortic stands for coordinate rotation, da 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 da. That was used for the navigation in the B-58 Hustler con contract. And uh, uh, the pseudo division, this is all kind of recent documentation within the last 50 or 100 years. Uh, pseudo division, pseudo multiplication by J.E. Maggot in an IBM technical journal in 1962. And then uh, the keyboard plan, uh, we were, one of the things we looked at is, is uh, reverse Polish notation. And it later came about, is, uh, there was a, a t-shirt you could buy from the Stanford bookstore that said, enter is greater than equals with a, a greater sign. And uh, if you remember, TI went with the equals, and HP always had the enter key. And the reason for that that you could work with stack architecture and you could do things without a, a bunch of parentheses and so on. You could keep track of your uh, notations much better. Now the, uh, the desktop calculator was a good complement for HP measurement product line. It was uh, the scientists and engineers were were used to you know, calculating things and so on, but they were all using the slide rule, and uh, or uh, some of the uh, Frieden and some of the other things had you'd enter the numbers and then you pull a handle. Engineers and scientists could work with variables directly from measured data, and just to be on the safe side, we had a wide range using the floating point, 10 to the minus 99, to 10 to the plus 99. And so far, I don't think anything is outside that range. That, that's a, a, lot of, a lot of space. Terrestrial to atomic range of numbers. It was an a architectural challenge. And uh, uh, how, do we, how do we do a wrong? Now, this was in the 60s. And I don't know if, if well, those of you that were working in the 60s, I don't know how many you were, but read-only memory, wrong. That was defined at an IBM talk that I went to, and it really impressed me. And uh, the first prototype, uh, Hewlett wanted it. Hewlett had a, a secretarial desk in his office, and on the left-hand side was a, a drawer that lifted up, and it was supposed to be a typewriter there. Well, he wanted the desktop calculator. And there it is. The first 9100, I think there were some follow-ons. The, now, as soon as he, the, oh, oh the, the, we tried that, the prototype, in his desk, and Hewlett was away on a business trip. And we went into his office, and we pulled up the, out the drawer, and we tried to slip the, the prototype in there. Didn't quite make it. And, oh, everybody said, oh my god, we've got the prototype done. What are we going to do? we got all the tooling. And I said, we'll call the carpenter shop. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we did, and, and he got it to fit. It was only about an eighth of an inch or so. And Hewlett came back from vacation and he saw that and the prototype sitting there. He just says, you guys, I knew you could do it. <laughs> now, but 
He wants, he wants the whole thing to fit in his pocket. He's impressed. He said, you could do this. Now there's some, some four-function machines out there, little calculators that fit in my pocket. Can't we do one with all the algorithms? Well, I knew algorithms by this time. The semiconductor density was just not, not sufficiently high enough. You know, Moore's, Moore's law was in progress, uh, but only SSI, small-scale integration, was in production. And uh, if we would, I kept telling him, well, every, every two years it doubles or a year and a half or whatever the Moore's law exactly was. I think it's still going on today. Hewlett, though, comes over and visits the lab every couple of months. You know, how are you doing? And I, I try to hide from him because I just can't, I don't have any ideas. But, you know, he, he comes around and, and talks to everybody. And he discusses his idea with the design group. Well, now they're going to design something, you know, and I've got to make it fit. Now, come on, this is, this is from the outside down. Uh, the, so anyhow, they design, uh, they do the, the shape and form factor. One of the key things, I don't know any of you that knew Barney Oliver, but he had very big fingers. And if, if you notice that, that you know, a, a lot of the, the phones today and so on, you, you bump into adjacent keys. You notice the HP 35, it was designed with a, a large key separation between the keys. So you wouldn't accidentally hit another if you hit something with your thumb. And uh, the, uh, the key layout spacing was very important. Now, the LED display had to be magnified. We decided that it was no good to just have a, a thing that only you could use. You'd have to show it to somebody, too, so you could talk about it. So we had to have a magnification, and we had to be very careful <coughs> that there'd be no blind spots so that we made the angle pretty wide, which was tough with the magnification. Now, he was talking to the mechanical engineers, too. And the, the mechanical team, there was a couple of guys working on that. And they, they made, if you remember, the HP 35 had a, a sound, a cricket, a child's cricket sound for a key down. And, and you, you could also, it had a texture, textile response. So you could actually feel the key hit bottom and come back. Uh, using and that used phosphor bronze metal strips for that. And now the collaboration begins. In fact, many we, we would try to get a, a, a job, a little G job done by the uh, by the machine shop to to try out some things and so on. And everybody, all we had to say was, this is for, for Hewlett's idea and uh, for his pocket size calculator. And everybody was anxious to, to you know, join the team. Now, I, I was out, I was always wandering around and, and checking with companies and seeing what was going and density and so on, semiconductor density. And, I saw a 10-digit calculator at Fairchild. And wow, they, oh, here's, here's a, a concept. Oh, we could use that. And it was a, a shift register dynamic architecture. In other words, it, it would disappear if you took the clock away. So as long as the power in the clock, then, then the thing would run. If you remember that the HP 35, you turn it off, it turned back on and none of your data was there because it, you couldn't, it was all dynamic. But this dynamic was extremely efficient. It, it only took a, a, essentially a, one, two transistors, one to transfer and one to hold the data for a little bit. And so it, rather than a, a six transistor for a, a fixed memory. Uh, and it, uh, think of a racetrack that there is 
although there's all these horses running around the track, the stadium is only looking at four, which is four bits, which is one digit. And that's, uh, and we had three of those set up, so we had three words always cycling around. And it was very, very efficient in architecture. It needed a few tweaks. Well, it didn't exactly fit our needs. But Fertile wasn't interested in making any of the changes for us. They just didn't see what we were doing to be any good. Excuse me. I remember who I am. Um, so I redesigned the architecture to fit our needs. And I roughed something out in a couple of weeks. And uh, I would uh, uh, develop a new instruction set, and I flowcharted major programs, and I estimate the power usage, and suggested suitable semiconductor vendors. But we have to go to Hewlett. We tell them that we that we got some ideas, but and uh, we showed them the flowcharts, showed them the architectural structure, and uh, we asked him for a go-ahead, and one million dollars. <laughs> and he just said, well, gee, I'm not sure that, that this is, because this is going to cost a lot of money. It's not just a $25 for a function calculator. It's going to cost a lot of money. And we didn't have any idea. We thought it would be several hundred dollars at least. Well, he commissioned Stanford Research Institute to study the market. And it's, SRI really had a tough time because they were asking focus groups to think about something that nobody had ever done. And so how could a person imagine you know, what they would do with it and how much it, the, the value was? But my boss, when we were walking back to the lab, says, oh, don't worry. We'll start it. We, we'll just start it with a petty cash you know, <laughs> under the table. So collaboration is in full swing. It's Hewlett's baby. And there was about 21 principal engineers and others wanted to get on board. And key engineers start designing circuits, uh, even a PhD. Uh, picks up the switching power supply design. Nothing was trivial. The amount of power usage. We wanted a, an eight hour minimum time that the, the batteries would last. So every little detail had to be paid attention. I think we got something like 80% efficiency out of the, the uh, three cell conversion into the powers for the, for the uh, MOS, they were uh, the PMOS circuits. Uh, rechargeable uh, batteries were investigated, and we chose some for uh, that had an eight hour life. Display reliability, uh, reliability. readability, uh, the LED intensity. It turns out the, the LEDs, uh, its brightness increases non-linearly uh, with the uh, amount of voltage or, or current through it. In other words, if you double the voltage, the light out of it would more than increase by a factor of two. Well, hey, that was something. I could strobe it so I could keep the current low but give it pulses of 100 milliamps <laughs> <laughs> when the average current would be one milliamp. And guess what? I get three or four times the light output. So the, the started to, to flow chart all the functions. The, I could lift the transcendental functions right out of the 9100 from a flow chart perspective and then apply them to the architecture of the HP35. And we were simulating the functions, the algorithms, 
the flowcharts with paper tape programs. And then we also had to verify that the algorithms were, were perfect, where we're meeting the, the uh, standards book. There was a big red book, I think it was from Naval Postgraduate School or something like that, that had 10 digits significant accuracy. So all the, the data was checked against that. Called it the big red book. And small angle accuracy all the way down through going, you know, if we're working 10 to the minus 99th to 10 to the plus 99th, hey, had to do the whole thing. And the dynamic range for verifying the limits. Uh, and one of the things, uh, and when somebody mentioned it here when I was just chatting on the side, was uh, a, a, a fella from UC Berkeley uh, who, who mentioned that uh, the, the math, uh, uh -huh. oh, uh, Willie, Willie Kahn, yeah. yes. And I had talked to him for, for some reason uh, and gone up and seen him in his office. And he, he says, you know, this, the small number accuracy, you can't let it go as the numbers get smaller. You have to maintain that 10 digit accuracy and I'm gonna be checking on you and I don't wanna see any bias in the error. So one of the things I did was run a bunch of random numbers and check for bias in the round off error. And, and you know, he, he was my mentor on that. <laughs> and uh, started programming the ROMs. Now, we looked at every aspect that I mentioned earlier, and one of them was the the segment shape, and it's really surprising in the other calculator designs have been mentioned, but it was surprising that we wanted the maximum readability. We didn't want uh, the numbers to look like backward letters, except uh, some people would turn to you, they would program a calculator and turn it upside down and write things, make things look, they could a program with different characters and make it say things. But anyhow, we wanted, when you look at the calculator face on, that you instantly recognize every segment and every number location as, as a number. And so we started tweaking the, uh, the LEDs. And it turns out that the brightness is also de uh, dependent upon the ratio of, of circumference to area of the LED segments. And I don't know if everybody knows that, but I learned by, by testing it and comparing it. Now, the, we designed the LED display with, a, a, I mentioned earlier, magnifier encapsulated design. Uh, this display driver and startup circuit were completed. And then we had a name the baby contest. The math marvel, Athena, god of the wisdom. <coughs> Hewlett says, what are you doing? We're trying to think a name for it. He says, well, it's the HP 35. <laughs> uh, how would you get that? He says, count the keys. <laughs> the uh, circuits arrive from two vendors and we start checking things out. First units are assembled. And we, at HP we had something called the next bench syndrome. And if the, you would try something out on the fellow working at the next bench. And if he liked it, it would probably be good for engineers. And we let a couple of the, the next bench people that weren't working on the thing try them out. Oh my gosh, they fell in love with it. Didn't want to give them back. The prototypes worked. Well, they had a few bugs. Uh, not, not all the calculators would turn on right and had to redesign the display driver to, to overcome that. The slide of 90 degrees sat there and, and went crazy, it flashed, 
instead of showing the largest number possible. You know, the sine of 90 degrees, well, the, the, the tangent, you know, it, it, it wouldn't even calculate that. So, Hewlett is ecstatic. It fits in his pocket. And we take the first couple of units to various individuals, and uh, it, it caught everyone by surprise. Fred Terman, mentor of, of Hewlett and Packard, uh, starting up, and he's the one that suggested they could get together and make a start a company. Uh, Louis Alvarez, Nobel Prize in Physics, he thought it, thought it should be named the eighth wonder of the world. <laughs> the popularity was totally unanticipated. It was number one product. And uh, it, it was just backlogged like mad. Now, we had a six week backlog even at $395. That was, the, that was the first price. That was the price it was offered at. And in fact, you could go to the Stanford bookstore and you could buy a t-shirt with a sign that says that is greater than equals for 395 and they give you a calculator. <laughs> <laughs> I still got that t-shirt. And uh, I remember in, in the cafeteria and I told Bill Hewlett, I said, hey, GE put in a request for quotation for 10,000 units. And Hewlett says, well, why would they do something stupid like that? He says, well, maybe they want to supply all of their engineers, each with their own calculator. He said, no, they can share them. <laughs> now, HP was a direct sales company. We had salesmen that would go and, and talk to engineers and so on, and, and, and sell them one at a time and so on. Well, the calculator was so popular that the salesmen all you know, cart what they could fit in their pockets around, and the sales were, were dropping in every other part of the field. So uh, it, it really was having an effect, and uh, so they limited direct sales, and department stores took over. Now, the, uh, uh, who would have thought that an HP uh, marketing manager would subscribe to Women's Word Daily? Now, that, that was the, it would tell you how many square feet uh, it took to, to sell a dollar for their product in, in Macy's. And, and on what location it Macy's, you know, the, the first floor was uh, something like $3,000 per square foot per year. The third floor would be $1,000 per square foot per year. So that was information that our salespeople needed. Well, they uh, uh, decided to establish a new, new division. It, it, it first, when it first took off, uh, this, they didn't expect the sales to be that great, and it was just a, an extension of the department. And the next thing you knew, it, it was its own division, and there was too much of a backlog. Now, we had an impact on society, because real numbers could be used in teaching. And do you allow it in class? And for several years, I was doing college recruiting at the time, for several years, I would talk to the professors and say, how are you handling this? And sometimes, some of the professors forbid it to be used for tests, uh, but people could use it on homework. Well, uh, it, it, pretty soon, it, uh, it took about a, a two years or so before the schools, universities, and, and a few high schools started to figure this out. And they either made calculators available to everyone, or they would um, loan them out, or lease them, or whatever. It, and finally, the calculators were fine on um, tests and so on. And it even became popular with non-engineers. 
it was it was kind of funny. I remember going to various parties at the time, and there'd be a bunch of guys clustered around one corner of the room, and and the women would all be standing on the other side, saying, well, "What are those guys looking at? Dirty pictures?" <laughs> and, and, no, they got a calculator. And some guy's demonstrating his new calculator. And it was no round off error, and the slide rule was, uh, uh, there was a, uh, the K and E survived by paper, but uh, uh, what was the other slide rule companies? Uh, I think, yeah, yeah, they, they were gone within a year. And it was, I, I, took, I took it back to uh, Oklahoma, I think it was, Tulsa or something, and, and loaned uh, the calculator to the um, American Airlines. And they would try it out in the cockpits to make sure it didn't interfere with their navigational equipment. And it went to the moon. It was a backup to the IBM computer. They put an HP 35 so they, gave, they could verify the, 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 the moon landing and the whole thing. There it is. Uh, this isn't mine because mine would have the, the, the little shiny thing above the on-off key all worn off. Oops. I pressed the wrong button. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, no, okay, there it is. Well, that was the chip. That was uh, uh, the, really the HP 35 circuit, uh, all the architecture. Uh, I don't expect you to see everything. <laughs> but, but, but you should be able to because this was, uh, uh, I think this was uh, five, uh, Five nanometers. <laughs> oh, that's uh, logarithmic mathematica. Yeah, that's that's that that treatise written in, in uh, 1624, whatever. Yeah, down at the bottom in London. Oh, and the IEEE uh, has awarded the milestone. Of the they do this uh, 35 years, or it has to be, I think, be since the product was invented to when they will do the award. This is uh, so one of the historical milestones was the HP 35. Any questions? Yes, there's one in the back. How big is the drama? Uh, the ROM was actually, the total ROM was three chips, and it uh, uh, was just a, uh, uh, a very simple, but it was uh, 250 uh, words in the ROM, and I, as I remember, I think the word was 12 bits wide, uh, but that, that was, that was big at the time. That, that was pushing the, the boundaries. And we actually had two companies, AMI and Mostec, make the chips. And they, they didn't, they made different chips because we were so concerned about security. We didn't want either of them figuring out exactly what we were doing. And so, uh, and getting those two companies to work, it, the, the chips will work. I mean, our engineers did a terrific job. You have a question. Uh, yes, I, I vaguely remember at the time that when, when the first shipment of those five integrated circuits, that it turned out that uh, because they were duplicating, that the ones, the ones that one company couldn't produce, the other ones could, and so it helped. Garrett. No, they were and actually, we, we split them up. It wasn't that they couldn't produce, yes. We were afraid of, of somebody taking the, the thing and running with oh, it. So they didn't overlap? Oh, no. They, they, they were, no. No, we didn't have duplication. Wow. 
but that, that was that was a risk, but that was you know we were we were uh, uh, at the time uh, we were in uncharted territory. We never knew that we couldn't judge from the desktop what the sales of the pocket would be, you know. So you know we just uh, deliberately worked with different companies for different <coughs> circuits. Later on, what, what it became known, what was all of Oh, yeah, yeah, later on, then each of them picked up uh, the other. Yeah, yeah, it worked out. Okay, uh, Sam. Okay. Uh, so you mentioned uh, you uh, strobed the LED to make it brighter. Yes. Was HP the first one to do that? Because uh, the way you make LED brighter is to increase voltage or lower the resistance. Well, but you, this was a very novel way to make it brighter. Well, no, it's just a characteristic of the gallium arsenide is the more current, uh, for uh, the more average current, or no, uh, let me put it this way: the the, the peak current makes it loud, brighter, but then it's only on for well, one sixty. I forget the the yeah, stroke the time. Tension helps, right? And so it's just it's just the the maximum current at the time, and then your eye integrates it. So uh, I don't know of other people, but I was playing around with a lifetime and, and trying to, to, to see what I could get out of it. And I had the LED lab right there, and they would do anything for me, and I'd come up with ideas, and I'd ask them questions, and so on. So, yeah, it was, I think it was unique at the time, but other people catch on. Uh, there was another question. Yeah. This goes back to the 9100. Is it true that one of the first ones was given to Arthur C. Clarke? <clears throat> uh, he called it uh, uh, Hal Jr. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. <Cool. laughs> Everybody knows what Hal stands for. Yeah, IBM minus one. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, so he called it, he came into the lab, and we showed him that, and he, and I think we probably gave him one. Uh, it's, it was a mistake, but he called it Hell Junior, yes. But I got to meet a few interesting people at the time. But then, uh, I, soon after, I, I left the labs, because after that, what do you do? <laughs> Retire? <laughs> yes. When you, when you talk to SRI and they did their marketing, um, did, did they suggest go ahead or you just said, well... Uh, that, that's a, a good question because they did respond to us. It took them about six months. So we were already well underway. But, but they said, well, if it's a four-function machine, you got to be under $100. And uh, anything else, we don't know what you're doing, and we don't know what, what would be a suitable charge. So we were uh, pretty astounded that uh, when we put together 395, which was, HP had a, a formula for determining the market price of any of its products. And you, you, they, there was people that could do this, that, and the other thing. Well, it turns out, that we use either pi as the number to multiply the cost of materials and labor, and we, or we use E if it was a, a tighter market. <laughs> and, and I had tried that on, you know, oh, no, 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 no. And they go off and they come back with the same number. <laughs> but I was surprised at the 395, and it really took off because we had only ordered something like 100,000 parts, and we ran through, through those in about six weeks. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it was really a, a, a shock, and it, and it changed. It changed HP. It changed HP marketing. It uh, from a, a direct sales, the certain products then, then became department store. It, you could buy them in Macy's. Yes. Were all the the HP 35s built at one location in one factory? It was uh, originally built in in uh, 
uh, down in Cupertino, and then it was moved to Corvallis, and, and Singapore, I think, at the same time. And there was an issue about manufacturing in Singapore that the IRS was interested in. And I remember testifying or giving expert witness and the cost of materials there, and cost of labor, and all this kind of stuff. They thought we were avoiding taxes. Yes? The HP 35, I believe, is the only calculator to have a recall. Yeah, I think so. You can blame that on me. <laughs> I was trying to economize on the amount of wrong. And uh, I, uh, so I was, I figured that I would never need a, an overflow if I, you know, I'm starting out. It's, it's, I should never get an overflow doing the algorithm, using the algorithm, because I had truncated the, uh, it's, it's a, uh, kind of a pseudo division where you divide and divide and you take it down to, to nothing and then and build it back up. Um, and I just never expected that I would have an overflow on it. <clears throat> Turns out that I did. And when uh, and somebody called me uh, on the phone and says, you know, I, I found a, a bug in the calculator. And I said, oh, well, really? Well, what is it? And he says, well, no, I think that's worth some money. And I and I said, well, no, I'm, I'm no, I'm interested in your bug. I can fix your calculator. And he and he said, uh, no, I don't want some money for it. So I I said, well, then uh, that's all right. Uh, if it's really a bug, somebody else will call me. Yeah. And two days later, somebody else called me. <laughs> and this time I checked it out. It was for real. And then I went to my boss, and I and I told him. About it, I was working at, uh, working for the uh, HP uh, the calculator division at that time, and uh, and he oh he's all over oh what are we gonna do? and so on and uh, how how are you gonna fix this and I well I got a fix for it and I was able to to economize on some of the <laughs> steps and so on and and I said well I've, I've got a fix for it and. Uh, and he says, well, how do you know that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not pervasive? And I said, well, my fix catches the, the basic thing of, of not catching an overflow. So I, uh, and he says, well, uh, I, I want you to, how, how long will it take to test this out? And I said, oh, I think 391 years. And it's, it's one calculation per, per second. You know, that's as fast as you can go. So what, is, what are you going to do? You're going to test 10 to the minus 99 to 10 plus 99. <laughs> How are you going to verify that? So finally, uh, then we held a big meeting. And, uh, and it would take about three or four weeks to get uh, uh, only one of the ROMs had to be changed. And uh, uh, at the meeting, Packard was there. And somebody, I think it was the marketing manager, the former marketing manager, <laughs> who said, suppose we don't tell anybody. <laughs> and Packard was sitting there at the, at the top of the front of the room. And you could hear the pencil break <laughs> that, that he was holding. And he said, hey. As long as my name is on this company, nobody's not going to tell anybody. <laughs> They're not, never withhold from the customer. So, so that and actually only about 25 percent of the of the calculators that were affected were ever exchanged. Oh really? 25. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people wanted to keep up for historical value. Oh. Yes. So. I actually spent some time reverse engineering your, your work on that firmware, and I noticed that in that in that final production ROM uh, with the fix, that there's exactly one word of ROM left over unused. So you had it, you know, only 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 one more you know word could have been used if it needed for the fix. But I was wondering when you were developing that, at some point you must have had it functional, but not yet compressed to fit in three ROMs, and, and there must have been some risk that it might have needed four. 
I was just basically wondering how much time did it take then to get it squeezed in to fit in the three ROMs? They didn't do it. I did it. That's, that's, what, that's, no, that's, that's what I said. It was, uh, I, I spent at least three months. Actually, uh, you know, you'd start out and I'd, yes, I'd, I'd have all the words that I wanted because I was prototyping this and using punch tape and on PDP machines and so on. But it, uh, oh, it, yeah, my daughter keeps telling me, uh, talk louder. Oh, yes. <laughs> but it, uh, uh, the thing is when you're programming, and I think probably every one of you have programmed at some point in time, you can always reduce it. You can always find a more efficient way to do the same thing. And particularly when you're working in machine code, then, and, you know, how often does somebody get a chance to write their own machine code and, and set up the whole, you know, the, all the words and so on? How, how many different, you know, you start out and you need a key down instruction. And no key down is, there's no key down. And so you, that was the, the one thing that, you, that bothered me that I didn't use it for anything else. It was just a key down instruction. But with other things like, uh, add this register to that register, and so on and so forth, then you use that in subroutines, and you develop various subroutines. And this is in machine code only. There was no high-level language. Yeah, it was a tough job. Yeah. If, if you were to search on the HP35 bug, or you use that term bug, um, and you'll get back quite a few different answers as to what the cause. But basically, could you say the cause was a programming error rather than a, an algorithm error? Oh yes, it was. A, I didn't catch an overflow. I, I deliberately didn't didn't have. You know, when you're doing a uh, multiplication, uh, which is successive additions. Then, uh, I, when I was using the algorithms, the uh, the sum of the uh, the natural log of point one, uh, you know, added up ten times, uh, would would theoretically never exceed cause an overflow. Well, there's there's random trash in the. In, in all the calculations, because I resolved it, I I resolved it down to zero. And so, if you're exponentiating, exponentiating back, then you're liable to catch an overflow. And I just didn't prepare for it. It, it was it was my fault, and it was easily fixed. And uh, and I I tried to uh, it was a decimal cardinal points, so I could. Check it out pretty easily, but uh, I, uh, who in here has never had a bug in programming? <laughs> <laughs> Let him cast the first stone. <laughs> Thank you, Sam again. Hey, so um, it, it seems like uh, this was truly trailblazing, you had to get new display technology, new um, uh, power design, new, new uh, ASIC or new uh, uh, chip, uh, I mean new everything. Uh, you said you also used a phosphor bronze metal strip. Is that for the uh, metal dome on the key or was that for something else? No, that was just for the keys. Okay. The phosphor bronze, yeah. The, the, you make a little cricket out of it and, uh, and that's uh, Bill Messon and a couple of other guys. Uh, uh, came up with that, and, and they they did a, an excellent job. The three hundred ninety-five dollar price is almost something that people will care in the marketing field. Yeah, you know, anytime you price a new product, you don't want to leave money on the table, but you can't predict the number of sales. And SRI says 
we're experts in marketing and we can't tell you anything. And uh, the people who do this normally say, well, we want a times two or times three, E or, or pi. Who actually made the decision that, okay, we settle on 395? I think it was suggested that he'll let uh, some number around that, and he and he did the final decision on that. Uh, at the time, uh, Packard was, uh, uh, I think, in the, working for the Defense Department, and uh, Hewlett was running the show. Uh, but uh, Hewlett had a, a great deal of influence on everything about the calculator. He was a driving force. Incredible. Oh, there's, hey, our photographer. That's Jake. So, after the 9100 was completed, and they said, okay, give me a pocket size version. Uh, the 9100 is a programmable machine. Did you guys immediately think we need to build a pocket size programmable machine? Or did you pull that out? That Initially, until the 65, you know, Yeah, it, it never <coughs> entered that anybody said it was just, it was not meant to be. It was just supposed to be as portable as the person. And uh, and it only had a, the 9100 plugged in. And so it was it never it was supposed to be programmable. Then I also, uh, on the programmable, on the HP 65, I designed the card reader. From, from ideas out of Fairchild. During the development of 35, it would, I mean, you're, you're doing something totally new and you're, you're solving a lot of, you know, incredible engineering problems. What, what, what was there any thinking or, 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 or brainstorming about saying, well, now we've got this 35 in this small case. What would we do with the 35 to help us toward the 65? I mean, was that a thought process at all? Not at all. Not, not from, uh, like I said, the, the most of the ideas uh, that came to, uh, they came to HP labs from other people, like the next bench syndrome, the engineers and scientists, and, or people from outside the company. And uh, uh, I, I certainly didn't think about card reader and so on, but other people, and I designed the card reader chip, but it was only because somebody else said, hey, we ought to do this and we ought to do that. I, uh, I actually went off and, and uh, developed a CMOS process to do CMOS to make a fixed memory. Uh, and that was the, I think, uh, 41C, the continuous memory. And uh, so I, I moved up uh, out of HP Labs to to uh, the uh, I forget what the uh, it was uh, oh I forget uh, it was on this little road up page uh, up Pageville a little bit and uh, uh, it, it'll come to me uh, tomorrow about three in the morning <laughs> <laughs> it was Deer Creek Deer Creek it came to me early. so it was a Deer Creek. Uh, was a little thing behind uh, uh, Frenchman's Tower, uh, so Pageman Road there, and it cut off. And uh, I think that uh, Elon Musk, uh, and they, they have the facility now, but anyhow. So we were developing CMOS up there uh, with uh, uh, notable engineers and so on from HP. So I just went in different directions. <coughs> Yes, Tom. Well, speaking of another direction, people might be interested to know you worked on that oscillator design in some form, too. You improved the 204, which I brought in. It's under the screen there. Oh, yeah, that little, yeah. <laughs> when I, I'll tell you, when I joined HP as a, as a summer help, we were doing manual marking of dials on a, um, oh, it was, it was an oscillator type of, of product. Uh, I think it was, uh, no, I'll think of it uh, like I said, three in the morning. But, uh, and I worked on a production line. 
and after uh, I think I've been there uh, well all summer long, and then I arranged my schedule at Stanford to have all afternoons for him. So uh, I was there for another few months when I was invited to join the one HP lab. There was only one at 395 Page Mill Road. That was the old sawtooth building down on Page Mill, almost to the railroad tracks. And then I worked as a junior engineer or technician on a, uh, it was called a 405 uh, digital voltmeter. And then after I graduated from Stanford, I got my own project. And that was the 3440 digital voltmeter. Uh, and that was just an extension of using uh, Nixie tubes and so on, but starting to use integrated circuits. And it, it, was, it was very interesting to do. So I, I got a, a excellent training at HP with the various products that would come up. And it was my theory that if I couldn't believe in something, I'd either change it or walk away from it. If you can't believe in the product you're developing, you shouldn't be on it. And, uh, and that was the old HP kind of allowed you to do that, understood. And it, it was really great to work for that. I, I don't know if uh, I've never worked at another company that was as good as that. I forget what the question was. About the oscillator. Oh, the, yes, and so then along came uh, Somebody suggested they, they wanted a, a, to do a transistorized oscillator like the, the 200A, and of course it, it could not be called a 200B or the C or D or that, no, so it needed to be a different number, so it was a 204. Oh, but not 204A, we don't make, want to make it sound like it's just the, the first one. We, it would be the 204B. <laughs> but that, that, again, that was a very interesting project. I actually learned uh, as much as, as I contributed to, the, to any of the products I worked on at HP. And I really value those years. Hey, I valued. Did you want a quick question? Because I'm going to sign off. Um, how did. How many 35s were ultimately sold? Oh. If I had a dollar for every one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, there was, uh, I think 35 uh, was probably in the 250,000 was the total because then, you know, the, uh, the 41, the 45, the 80s. Uh, the 80 I contributed to uh, by helping somebody write the program for it. Uh, in fact, I taught Steve Wozniak how to program the machine code, and he sent me an email thanking me. He still thinks of me as his god. And I told him, you and who else wants a homebrew computer? <laughs> Hey, I really appreciated you inviting me to talk here. You're retired. Are you doing any consulting at all now? Uh, only if somebody calls. <laughs> I, I was consulting as, uh, I think I did uh, some consulting last year for the, for, uh, the Department of Professional Engineers in Sacramento. But since they saw me on the on a witness stand down in LA with a cane and hobbling around, they don't call me anymore. <laughs> so, but I do appreciate you calling me even though you knew I had a cane. <laughs>